it's uh, it's my job to introduce uh, to or to be the first introducer of Janice Rogers Brown, and I wrote down a judge, and then I wrote down a lady, and then I thought, no. I think Janice can be better described as a soul. She, she's such a soul that um, uh, biographical detail is just incidental and hangs upon her and, and, and makes her look beautiful, but the essence is the soul, not the biography, and meeting Janice is like meeting the soul of Western philosophy itself. So uh, when I speak uh, to my children or to Seth about Janice, I say she is Janice Martin Luther Rogers Brown, <laughs> because I hear from her something like Martin Luther, but not everything, but some know, know a lot and say a little, no need to answer each question. As in Luther, or sometimes she's Janice George Washington Rogers Brown. <laughs> Having finished the work assigned me, I retire from the great theater of action <laughs> to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. <laughs> um, or she is Janice Edward Cook Rogers Brown. You fill in the right law. Um, or for that matter, Janice James Wilson Rogers Brown. Law and liberty cannot rationally become the objects of our love unless they first become the objects of our knowledge. <laughs> and of course, Janice Calvin Coolidge Rogers Brown. <laughs> About the Declaration, there is a finality that is exceedingly restful. If all men are equal, that is final. About souls, uh, there's a line about souls I heard from someone once, and I was thinking about this with, with Doug and with Coolidge and James Wilson and certain other friends here. You've heard the phrase, souls travel together. The way I interpret that, and you may know a, a finer meaning, but is that it, one makes one's way it, uh, uh, anonymously through the wood of life and then unexpectedly encounters deep at some crossing in the wood a sympathetic acquaintance from a place in the distant past who has made his way to this place separate to you and you both happen to have arrived here. So, uh, souls travel together. Um, when I was first introduced to Janice by Will, where is Will? Right there is Will, who will speak after me, um, by email. Um, I thought, gee, um, I hope Will and Janice, these souls will allow me and Calvin Coolidge to accompany them, particularly her, for at least a stretch, because the, both souls have to want to be together, right? <laughs> not, not always. Uh, and Janice blessed the Coolidge Foundation by becoming a trustee, and I know she supports many groups here, which, during which period I also got to consider, and we at the foundation also got to consider why her soul inspires us so much. One reason is that Wilsonian and Coolidgean attachment to knowledge when Janice takes up a topic, she looks into it before she speaks. She doesn't slop over with too many words, as Coolidge would say. She prepares every word. Her mind is as neat as her hotel room, which I will assure you is very, very neat. <laughs> I've seen it through the window. Um, because we've traveled together. Um, that organization also was what makes her such a stunning judge or prosecutor. Our students love Janice because of the daring points she makes, but even more because she supplies evidence for those points, whether they're in the law or about philosophy or history. Her precision is a gift in an age of windbags and rhetorical floppiness, and the students know it right away. Many conservative institutions barrage young people with imperatives. You know, they say, love America, be a patriot, blah, blah, blah. Um, some young people don't respond well to that. They have to come to an idea themselves. They, they, they don't like what we sometimes call unreflected patriotism, unconsidered patriotism. They see that Janice's patriotism is well thought through, the result of um, reflection, deliberate, and they follow. 
Um, second, Janice never talks down to people. She never infantilizes them. I, I w had to laugh when she spoke to our little eighth graders in their citizenship contest. And she said, she told about how when she was in college, she, she, had, she didn't know how, what would happen because she had three, three people or three souls battling in her, a writer, a philosopher, and, and a lawyer. And which should she, oh, an economist maybe. Maybe it was four, Janice. Um, all in her struggling to be Janice. And, um, and I thought, that's exactly right. Wh which prevails, it's not clear. The complexity of the different impulses and the kids were, is this the exorcist? I mean, they were, they were, well, yeah, I mean, but they were, they were very, very interested. She didn't say, one day I smiled and became an attorney. She talked about that struggle. Third, Janice is brave, brave to go uh, against the California establishment when she was younger, brave in her confirmation hearings, of course, here, brave to hand down righteous, but sometimes um, unpopular opinions, rulings. Um, we love Janice because she's game. W whatever Janice does, she does with great vigor, even when it comes to sport. Recently, I happened to be salmon fishing with her in Alaska, and I was ready to retreat in my waders after one hour. Um, Janice doesn't merely fish. She waits the fish out. <laughs> she wrestles the fish down, <laughs> and home he comes on the little flat boat. Um, You've heard about her climbing after when she, 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 when she finally did resign from the DC circuit. I have an email from John Yu, her dear colleague and friend of many of us, who said um, when they, the pair were in Peru recently to establish a new version of MIT, they, she went up Machu Picchu. Um, she was very adventurous, writes John, and tried anything but except she drew the line at fried guinea pig on a stick. <laughs> Very brave. Um, finally, she mesmerizes her audiences, and I've seen that over and over again, and you have with kids. She, um, and to the point about Abby and Diana, Janice, um, as well as she speaks, she is not a carper. She is not a whiner, and she is not interested in appearing the wittiest at the table per se, right? She is a builder. She is about crafting new institutions and constructive change, no matter how tiny and pathetic they may be, because we've all started little institutions and she helps them build out to become more serious and great. And that's certainly what happened with Philip Hamburger and the new Civil Liberties Alliance when he just got the idea. And with James Wilson and Hadley's new venture in Washington and Doug's. And of course, with the Calvin Coolidge Foundation, which is relatively new on the scene as well. Souls travel together. All of the souls in this room, Janice, are grateful to you for the privilege of the chance to travel with you, if only just for one stretch. Thank you. We also uh, have uh, with us Will Hahn, who uh, uh, is senior counsel at Beckett. Will, where are you here? I'm right here. Oh, you're right there. Okay. And uh, defends rel religious liberty before the Supreme Court. He was part of the legal team that garnered a 9-0 decision at the Supreme Court level on Fulton versus the city of Philadelphia in 2021. So uh, he, he's got stripes. He clerked for Judge Brown at the D.C. Circuit. and. Uh, so he uh, has that perspective on her. And uh, he was a member of Hadley's first uh, Marshall Scholar class, so Hadley tells me, at Claremont, when Hadley was uh, the lead teacher of that Marshall uh, uh, program. Uh, please join, join me in welcoming Will Hahn. Thank you. I'm I'm truly thankful to join everyone this evening in honor of my friend, uh, my mentor, and 
the woman that my oldest children have long thought of as their adopted grandmother. She even refers to them as her grand clerks, and that's, of course, <laughs> Judge Brown. Uh, I was asked to share some thoughts on Judge Brown's life and her work, and that's a humbling task, and frankly, it's one of the most intimidating tasks that I've ever been assigned. Uh, as she's often said of her own heritage, it includes not only the middle passage, but the trail of tears. Not only the rhythms of midnight trains, but the terrors of midnight riders. Jim Crow and Jim Dandy, exploding churches and burning crosses. There are experiences of her life, like being born in the only Greenville hospital that would accept blacks, or being educated at a school named to remind blacks that they could be trained but not educated that I simply can't relate to, and I'm not going to try. Nor am I going to presume to speak for the impact that she's had on the countless lawyers, law students, and dedicated public servants after serving for over 20 years as a judge on three different courts, with most of that time spent on the DC Circuit. And during that time, she's written literally volumes of opinions. And while I'll refer to some of them in passing, there's no way I could do all of them or anywhere close to all of them justice tonight. And frankly, I'm not entirely sure she would want us to. Uh, and that's for at least three reasons. Uh, the first is that Judge Brown's humility would probably mean that she would hate this speech. Um, this, the second is that D the DC Circuit is often referred to as the Supreme Court of Administrative Law. And this is supposed to be an enjoyable awards ceremony <laughs> on Easter Friday. So it's not really the time to discuss a topic that, as Justice Scalia put it, requires you to lean back, clutch the sides of your chair, and steel yourselves for a pretty dull lecture. <laughs> and the third reason is implicit in the line the judge would use when her California friends would still refer to her as Justice Brown after she joined the bench in Washington. She would gently correct them by going, no, no, there's no justice on the DC circuit. <laughs> So instead of focusing our attention on any of these topics, I will try to focus on what seems, at least to me, at the heart of Judge Brown's jurisprudence. One of the real gifts of clerking for Judge Brown is that we would spend hours every day in wide-ranging conversation. The personal, the professional, current events, the Book of Job, C.S. Lewis, George Washington, FERC regulation, <laughs> trying to say something nice about the NLRB, what the best desserts are, John Wayne movies, the Clean Air Act. Somehow in a conversation with Judge Brown, all these topics always fit together. In short, what made the clerkship so special is that every day was a heart to heart. And when you know someone's heart, getting lost in the minutia of any given case seems like you're missing the forest for the trees. And the focus on the heart helps us, or at least helps me, understand what would lead one former law clerk of hers in looking back at Judge Brown's opinions to conclude that there will never be another Judge Brown. What set Judge Brown apart as a judge, in my view, is the conviction that if you are not immersed in a genuine love and appreciation for the history of this nation, you cannot faithfully interpret its constitution. You simply won't get it. This conviction makes Judge Brown's jurisprudence a stumbling block to the utopians who are reserving their patriotism for a country they wish to coerce into being. This conviction makes her jurisprudence a challenge to those who would be willing to vindicate our founding principles if they think it will go over well with the zeitgeist. And it makes her jurisprudence an enigma to the technicians, the ones who approach constitutional interpretation as a lawyer's game and not a faithful handing on of our traditions. But most importantly, Judge Brown's conviction that being immersed in what makes America exceptional is required to faithfully understand the Constitution is what also makes her jurisprudence an inspiration to those of us that see the law as something more than a game and consider the right answer as not a prize for being clever in your lust for power, but a step closer to knowing truth himself. Judge Brown's love for the American regime and her application of that in constitutional interpretation comes from her deep appreciation of the American heart. As she would often say, as a descendant of slaves, aversion to slavery is encoded in my DNA. 
and Judge Brown assumed that the American psyche reflected a similarly steely disenchantment. Within the heart of our founding generation, Judge Brown sees a sober realism that considers good character, order to objective truth, as the only way for freedom to endure, and implicit in how the Constitution allocates power. This is how Judge Brown could argue, as she did in a 2011 speech at Stanford Law School, that the Constitution depends on citizens who must know and practice honor. By crafting a form of government that was realistic in its assessment of human nature, it made and preserved the cultural room to cultivate the qualities of character that tame the enemy from without and tame the power lust within. In this respect, she agrees with John Adams' observation that our Constitution was made for a moral and religious people, and it is wholly inadequate for any other, because its conception of self-government presumes that the American people already know self-government. Without that formation, as Adams explained and Judge would quote in Keep Siegel versus Purdue, avarice, ambition, and revenge or gallantry would break the strongest cords of our Constitution as a whale goes through a net. There are, in short, as Judge continued in that opinion, norms upon which self-government depends. The Constitution presumes them, but the character of our people determines whether we keep them. To understand what power was truly inside or outside of government's legitimate scope then, her jurisprudence shows us that one must understand the norms on which the Constitution is framed. And her recognition of that distinguished her among other judges who are also committed to discovering the Constitution's original meaning. For her, the original meaning could not be reduced to ever thicker historical commentaries on technicalities or empirical analysis of word usage nor was her quest consigned to just the views of the most prominent founders or the presumption that the founding could be reduced to some grand philosophical enlightenment project. Rather, I think Calvin Coolidge summed up the way Judge Brown looked at the original meaning well in a 1925 speech on the Declaration of Independence when he said that before we understand the conclusions of the American colonists, we must go back and review the course that they followed. That course, which was, while influenced in general by the speculations that have been going on in England, was a course centered on the meeting house. They were intent on religious worship. While scantily provided with other literature, there was a wide acquaintance with the scripture. They were subjected to this discipline not only in their religious life and educational training, but also in their political thought. So an inquiry into what the American people ordinarily understood the Constitution to mean required an immersion, Kudlich says, in the texts, the sermons, and the writings of the early colonial cl clergy who were earnestly undertaking to instruct their congregations in the great mystery of how to live. They preached equality because they believed in the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. They justified freedom by the text that we are all created in the divine image, all partakers of the divine spirit. No other theory, Kudlich co concluded, is adequate to explain the founding. We see this respect for the divine providence that form the common sentiments of ordinary Americans throughout Judge Brown's speeches and opinions. She devoted a Heritage Foundation address to reclaiming the idea of the forgotten man, a man who, as Amity's great work has taught us in a book of the same name the judge relied on in that talk, has been grossly distorted since the New Deal. The forgotten man, as Judge Brown said, was the one who preserved the traditional American aversion to tyrannical power but he's often the one left to underwrite the government's rush to right every perceived wrong. After the New Deal, the passion for government experimentation and indifference to consequences ended up increasing the suffering of ordinary people. The new purported expertise of regulatory power, which is the so-called wisdom that was often under judicial review during judge times on the DC circuit, is thus in deep tension with the qualities of character and faith that created the norms that Judge Brown sees as underlying a faithful understanding of the Constitution. So given this disconnect and Judge Brown's love for the nation, it's no surprise that her opinions often took the same tack as the Declaration of Independence, submitting to a candid world the facts of government power grabs. Time and again, Judge cascaded the government pur for purporting what she called photo op compassion to put ideological constituents, to pet ideological constituencies using other people's money. Similarly, Judge was unafraid to articulate the various ways in which regulatory capture distorts the presumptions of our founders' design and, in turn, the people's character, be it in elevating the regulation, the protection of pornography over electoral speech, 
creating a double standard between property and economic freedoms on the one hand and individual freedoms on the other, twisting acceptable commercial speech regulation into a tool to make private companies government <coughs> mouthpieces, or how the government's growth into the area of life left for religion has led to the state rehabilitating orthodoxy and squelching accommodation. Now, some may dislike the fact that Judge, as she said herself, will occasionally write at the top of her lungs. <laughs> but if we recall that for Judge Brown, love for the regime is what's required to faithfully interpret the Constitution, then we know that these clarion calls are the refreshing intellectual honesty that we all claim to want in our public officials, but then we suddenly shy away from when we actually get it. Judge Brown was and is ready to fight for this country because her life has seen both America at its best and at its worst, and she still sees the divine grace that's kept the darkness from overcoming the light. She's therefore seen it as her duty to, as she put it in one speech, and I'm sorry for stealing your thunder, to do her damnedest to keep our inheritance. <laughs> and again, I see this in Kudlidge when he said in the same speech I referenced, if we're going to maintain that great heritage that's been bequeathed to us, we must be like-minded as the fathers who created it, and we must not sink into a pagan materialism. Judge Brown knows and believes that. And thank God that she does. Now, I'll end tonight by taking up the observation from one of Judge Brown's other former clerks that there will never be another Judge Brown, and how we might be able to answer that question, hopefully. Perhaps an answer comes from a topic the judge focused on in many of her latter speeches, which is from Julian Benda's work, The Treason of the Intellectuals. Benda explained that what made the West possible, and thus America possible, is that those who applied the West's intellectual heritage recognized an obligation to teach the best of what we've learned, that, moral, that the morality of an act is in its disinterestedness, that good is a decree of reason insofar as it's universal, that a, one's will is only moral if it seeks its law outside of its objects. And so we're all required, if we really want to govern ourselves, to overcome the parts of our passions motivated primarily by power or willing to redefine reason and truth to achieve our desires. Thanks to that teaching, Benda explained, and Judge would often say this in speeches, quote, humanity did evil for 2,000 years, but honored good. This contradiction was an honor to the human species and formed the rift whereby civilization slipped into the world, close quote. But now those same intellectuals, and appropriately for a judge, Benda called them the clerks, they use their intellect to redefine truth, to organize political hatreds, and teach that when a will is successful, that is, it achieves power, that fact alone gives it moral value. In short, there's no objective truth, no objective reality, no need to be morally formed in anything, and certainly no need to love a system of government premised on sober expectations for human achievement and limits on power. Although Judge would probably say, if you think that all reality is a social construction, go up to the top of the building and jump and see what happens. <laughs> when one leaves Judge Brown's chambers, this is so often the world that a clerk finds among the other clerks in the legal profession. And when I think about being as a part of her last class of clerks, what it was like to leave her chambers and enter law practice again, I recall experiencing this disconnect between clerking for her and practicing law in the way that Aslan warned Jill Pohl as he dropped her from the mountain to achieve her mission in Narnia in the silver chair. Here on the mountain, I've spoken to you clearly. I will not often do so down in Narnia. Uh, the, in Narnia, the, or here, up here, your mind, the, the air is clear and your mind is clear. As you drop down into Narnia, the air will thicken. Take great care that it does not confuse your mind. And the signs which you have learned here will not look at all as you expect them to look when you meet them there. That is why it is so important to know them by heart and pay no attention to appearances. Remember the signs and believe the signs. Nothing else matters. If there will be another Judge Brown, or perhaps more important to all of us who admire her, if we simply want to honor her legacy properly, we too should remember the signs of our founding. Remember where we came from in the West and love it, not because it's always been perfect, but for the reason Judge Brown loves it, because she saw that God blessed it. And in orienting our lives to know, love, and serve him, we can remember the signs of his love that brought our founders to a place where a people formed in his commands could be truly self-governing and thus truly free. If we remember those signs, perhaps we can be too. 
Thank you, Judge, for remembering the signs and for inspiring me to do the same. And God bless you always.